In this episode, I interview Godfrey Devereaux, yoga and meditation teacher of over 45 years' experience. Godfrey is the author of several books, including Dynamic Yoga and Yoga Unveiled, a translation and commentary of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. In this fascinating conversation, we discuss how watching his uncle, an Anglican minister, pray in the yoga posture called tree pose sparked an overwhelming sense of reverence. How Godfrey's teenage attempts at learning from books produced surprising results. Why meeting his Indian yoga guru heroes left him unimpressed. And how the rigorous discipline of Zen and the insight of one particular Zen teacher changed Godfrey's life forever. This conversation was particularly enjoyable for me because Godfrey's the man who trained me in the practice and teaching of yoga in my mid-twenties. So, without further ado, Godfrey Devereaux. Hello, Steve. <laughs> Hi, Godfrey. Shall we begin? Begin. Okay. In your book, Dynamic Yoga, you write, Godfrey began yoga practice in 1973, having seen his uncle Tim, an Anglican minister, praying in tree pose. Can you talk about your first encounter with yoga? and the effect that it had on you? Yes. First of all, I think it's fair to say that my uncle, I was 16 then, and my uncle was the only adult whom I respected because he was the only adult who seemed to be able to relate to people of all ages and types and races and whatever. Um, so I, I have to you know, put that in as a, as a prelude, that I, that I had a lot of respect for this guy. Um, and it just so happened that... Um, I saw him in his kind of private um, contemplation space, standing in, in tree pose before the altar, and I felt something coming off him very clear, very strong, very palpable, and I knew that I wanted it. And I think I could honestly say that I hadn't any idea up until that point if I wanted anything in my life you know I had no career plan nothing like that but I felt this thing and I could tell you from memory what it felt like I felt it in my body and I felt it as something very very deeply peaceful but there was another quality which at the time I interpreted as awe but now I think having sort of made my own journey, it I would probably use the word reverence now. So anyway, that's what I felt, and, and I wanted it. Why the word reverence? Well, um, because I suppose that's what I feel. Um, and at the time, I had no idea what reverence was, so I just thought it was awe. But um, so why reverence? I, I suppose it's like... A, what does reverence mean to me? It means um, something to do with with the dynamic between between you as as the observer, if you're the or the experiencer, and what's being experienced and how mind blowing it is. You know, and mind blowing to the point that you really don't have anything to say about it. Having seen that, how did you begin your own yoga posture practice? Well, it was a bit tricky because I asked him to teach me and I have no idea why he said no, but he he gave me the books that he'd used, which actually two of them were just theory written by a French Jesuit priest about why yoga was not a religion and therefore you didn't have to be intimidated by it and how, in his opinion, it was the best form of prayer that human beings had ever come up with. And then he gave me what was, in fact, a crappy little book, but very famous at the time, um, written by a guy called Richard Hittleman, who had a TV program in California in the 60s. I used that for, for a while, but it was really calisthenics or whatever they call it. It wasn't really that much yoga. It was a bit distorted and it had a very definite exercise flavor. But then I found Teach Yourself Yoga by the Belgian guy, Andre van Lisbeth, and, and I then started to get into a practice based on what I found in there. And from what you've told me in the past, you achieved quite a, a, a high level of skill in terms of the postures, even at that point, uh, or so you thought, until you met an Iyengar teacher who challenged your practice, particularly in the area of alignment. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I suppose I was very young. I'd been playing a lot of sports, so my body was very um, ready to kind of do anything. So I could stand on my head, put my feet on my head, put my leg behind my head, all the things that seemed to suggest 
some kind of accomplishment. Um, but what actually happened was I was taken to a class by um, a friend, really. And um, as I walked in, I noticed that all of the other people besides him who was, you know, I was maybe 20 something and he was maybe 30 something and, and everybody else was over 45, some of whom were maybe in their 60s and they're all ladies. And, and so I had this very kind of arrogant, quiet, private reaction to myself, huh, you know, I'm better than them sort of stuff. Uh, but by the end of the class, I, I, I realized how arrogant that had been. And, and I had been almost, at least only in my own mind, totally humiliated to discover that I, that I was completely lost and couldn't do anything that they could. I didn't have their stamina. I didn't have their body awareness. I didn't have anything like that. And the teacher, I think she, she somehow sensed what was going on. Um, and afterwards, I, I went to her and, and I thanked her. And she, she said, um, well, she asked me if I, if I was doing yoga alone. I think she could, she could tell that. And I said, yes. And, and I said, well, I, there isn't a teacher. I'm living in Italy and it's, it's not possible. So she very kindly said to me that I could come and visit her one afternoon in a few days' time. And then she went through everything that I was doing. I, I showed her everything I was doing. She told me how to do it safely. Um, and then she said, but I think you should be practicing these things. And then she taught me some standing postures, the things that we'd be doing in the class that I hadn't been able to do. And then I remember the last thing she said was, and um, practice with your eyes open. Because, of course, I was doing it with my eyes closed. And, and that was it. And that completely changed my direction. But it also made me understand that you can't really do any old how. Because if you do it any old how, you're just staying in the same old pathways and habits, even if you are getting stronger and more flexible. This was the 70s. Yeah, this, this would have been 1978 that that, that, that happened. So I was living in Italy at the time. What was it like to be into yoga and in, into this sort of thing at that time? Was, was there a lot of awareness in, in England and in Italy and places like that? Well, in Italy, there didn't seem to be any, but there probably was some. Um, and in England, th there was a little bit because somehow um, Mr. Enge had been to England first, I think, in the late 60s. And, and he had a group which included the teacher that I stumbled into the class of in, uh, up in Northumberland. Um, of teachers who were, were were like deeply inspired and and they somehow managed to get into the adult education world so many schools or colleges or whatever that were hosting adult education classes free for the public offered yoga classes but only Iyengar yoga classes um, so it, it 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 was there and outside of that situation there was a kind of a sense that yoga was for weirdos but as I was anyway a weirdo I didn't really have a sense of that in what way were you a weirdo well marginal I wasn't playing the game you know I was a dropout I was a hippie dropout the next waypoint I think to, to cover would be what happened next in terms of your yoga uh, journey and so on but yeah it seems like there might have been some other interesting things going on parallel to that well yeah there was actually what took me to Italy really was love but what I found there was the Montessori teaching method which it has turned out has deeply informed my teaching, um, especially my my training of teachers, but even my teaching has been deeply informed by that because that was it was a very concrete, practical methodology, educational methodology, um, which somehow gave me a sense of uh, the significance of the somatic um, and the significance of direct, concrete experience. Could you talk a bit about your encounter with with the Montessori method and? You eventually became a teacher of teachers in Montessori, didn't you? No, no, I was just a teacher. I, I, I only went so far as opening a school in, in America. Um, I went, but it wasn't really for me. I, you know, I knew, I knew in, in my heart, I think, as soon as I started, that it wasn't for me. And I, the reason why I was a little bit kind of contradictory in a sense, because the Montessori method in itself is very spacious and generous and understanding towards children. Um, but it was being it, it was being taught um, within the context of the overall educational system. So actually, there was a lot of pressure to kind of push the children um, in certain directions, and I just I, I refused to do that. And so I was actually all, almost every day I was getting into trouble from management, saying really from the point of view of the Montessori method ridiculous things to me, like you know Godfrey, I, I, we never hear you shouting at the children. 
um, but you know, you really need to. And I said, well, actually, I'm a Montessori teacher, so I, I don't. Um, so um, it, uh, I knew it wasn't for me. I preferred to just hang out and, and have a good time with the children, help them, of course, but I wasn't going to try to push them into their parents' ambitions. How did you encounter the Montessori method? And what, what was it about it, do you think, that grabbed you initially? It was nothing. It was just the love story. I wanted to be with my love, and that's what she wanted to do. And um, Yeah, that was, that was it. You could say it was good grace, good luck, chance. Mm -hmm. And in your essay uh, entitled Dedication, you have a line for Timothy Leary, the Harvard professor, made famous for his promotion of LSD and uh, psychedelics in general. And you write, Timothy Leary, for inspiring me to look inside. And have psychedelics been a part of your journey? And if so, in what way? I get the sense that perhaps they were in this period. Well, they were, they were in that period, definitely. And I would say, even though I don't take them anymore, they still are in the, they, 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 what, what I derived from taking what most people probably classify as a huge amount of LSD over a period of about four years. Um, it, it, you could say it's still being confirmed and reinforced by my experience, especially my yoga and meditation experience. What's a huge amount of LSD and what were the experiences there that are still being, that are still unfolding and being confirmed today? <laughs> well, number one, I, I took LSD three or 400 times. Um, I was doing it very, very often when I was 16, 17, 18, 19, and then I just stopped. But um, also, I would sometimes take vast quantities, which means that every three or four hours, I'd double what I'd taken and, and um, carry on and maybe be, be under the influence for anywhere between 12 and 24 hours instead of just a normal kind of eight hours. Um, but for me, it was very definitely, it was not a form of escapism. It was very definitely a form of um, exploration of how I saw it then, the nature of reality and consciousness. What sort of things did you discover? That's the long time to be on acid. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I, I discovered many things, but uh, I suppose in a way, the most significant thing that I discovered was that our quotidian perceptual experience is um, in a sense arbitrary. It's, it's defined not only by the nature of our nervous system, but it's also defined to a great extent by the no nature of our social and cultural systems. So I suppose I discovered that, that reality as we think we know it is not a reality at all, but a projection. Of course, it's based on something solid and, and, and uh, objective, if you like, but you know, not everybody responds to every element of it in the same way. And so from here, you studied with many great teachers in, in yoga and Advaita in India, I'm guessing, by, by where they are located. Yeah. So at some point you must have gone to India. Did that happen next? It took a while because I, I, I knew that yoga was my life in a sense um, from right from the beginning. Um, and because I was a European, um, I... I I decided that I wanted to demonstrate that you could go deep into yoga without going to India, that it was not necessary to go to India. So I, I resisted for a very long time, but finally I succumbed and went. I think it was in 1990, something like that. Well, let's cover a little bit then the time between your Iyengar encounter in Northumberland and going to India. What were you up to at that time in terms of yoga and in terms of what you're doing in your life? My life, many things. Um, I've, after being a Montessori teacher for a while, I then set up in Brighton a natural food supermarket about 20 years ahead of its time, really. Um, and I had become, while in America, actually, I had become involved in the natural food movement quite deeply. One, as... Um, a nutritional counselor, you could say, with the, from the macrobiotic point of view, but also working in natural food businesses, restaurants, import, export companies. Um, so I was developing, um, you could say, a deep interest in in the, the physical, the organic side of health and awareness. It was it was it was not for me just about health. It was about how eating affects your judgments and your ability to perceive things clearly. Um, and my yoga was was 
it, it was I hardly ever went to class I went to the odd workshop but it was Iyengar based my practice um, all the way till about 1989 or so when I I, I was on um, what I called my little world tour, which means I had gone to the Caribbean to teach yoga. I went to the mainland of America to teach yoga. I, I didn't know where I was going after I went to Hawaii, um, which was which is the third place where I had a, a workshop arranged. Um, but in Hawaii, I was teaching in the yoga shala that belongs to Nancy Gilgoff, who was the first woman to be taught by Patel Choice, and she invited me to a class, so I went to this class, Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga class, and I was completely blown away by the depth of the experience that I had, which specifically in terms of many of the things that Mr. Enga himself and his teachers had been suggesting by their words that I should be able to do, but I'd never been able to do, I found them organically happening. Um, Within, within this deep internalization and continuous flow of, of this practice within which the postures themselves were all familiar to me, um, but the continuity and the linking was not. Uh, so it's something about the constant movement of the one posture to the next. Yes, I think hard to be sure, really, self-analysis is not always that reliable, but I think it was the continuity um, rather than anything specific. Um, certainly, it was nothing to do with bandhas because I wasn't doing them, I didn't know them. It was nothing to do with ujjayi breathing, as it's called. It was nothing to do with drushti. So all of those kind of esoteric elements of the Ashtanga Vinyasa system were not participating in the experience. And I'm absolutely sure it was just that, well, maybe it was my pride. I didn't want to collapse. I, I wanted to keep going, you know, because I wanted these people to maybe think about coming to my workshop um, so I kept going. So so I think I really got to a point very quickly that the only way I could keep going was to focus inter and internalize my energy in a way that I'd never had to do before. Which produced what effect? A very deep internal awareness. So then I was feeling things happening in my body, which was very clear that happened before, but I'd, but I'd, ne I'd been heard about them as instructions, you know, like, take your inner ankle bones back or whatever. And, and I could feel this very subtle movement happening. I, I wasn't doing it as a direct action, but it was, it was clearly an impact of other things that I was doing, which I was doing deliberately, like broadening and lengthening my feet, because I'd been taught also to do that. What effect did that have at that class? What happened next? <laughs> well, I think it had two effects. One, I decided, I decided that this was real yoga, of course, that was a very superficial assessment, but that, that was what I decided. So I, I, I went back to the UK and I sought out Derek Island and I took two or three classes with him. Um, but I very soon kind of went my own way within the Ashtanga system. Um, but the other thing that happened, which was more pertinent to my teaching, was that, that I understood this very crucial, um, pragmatic and experiential distinction that, that had not been pointed out to me, I suppose, because it hadn't been conceptually recognized, which is that most of the events, the physical events or the changes taking place in a yoga posture do not have to be done, can't be done. They are actually impacts of the, uh, let's call them principal actions that do need to be taken. And if all of those principal actions are taken, then all of the secondary actions, which are in fact impacts, will happen. So then this allowed for an incredible simplification of the teaching process. I didn't anymore have to suggest to people that they had to take their inner ankle bone back or their shin bone in or their shoulder blades down or lift the arches of their feet. I only had to point out to them and ask them to do those things that would make all of those things happen. This is the, the phrase you have, confusing actions with impacts. Yes, yes. No distinction being made in the minds of the teachers, and therefore I can only assume not in their experience of their own body either. And one might be forgiven for making that confusion uh, in the instruction set of most, most of the way yoga is taught. Oh yeah, absolutely. Students forgiven, teachers should not be. Why do you say that? <laughs> <laughs> because it's the responsibility of a teacher to test and challenge what he's teaching so that he can be absolutely sure that this teaching is doing what it's supposed to be doing.
it, it's no, I don't think it's valid for, especially a yoga teacher, but even a tennis teacher, just to, to pass it on because that's what was given. Does it work? Is it valid? Do you think it takes a certain type of person, a certain sort of personality to really actually test and examine what they're given rather than taking it on faith? Yeah, I imagine so. I agree with you. I think, I think it's not, let's call it um, spontaneous self-inquiry is not something that is given to everybody. Most people would prefer to be told which way to go and how to go there. Um, and some people are just not satisfied with that. And I don't think that, that I'm necessarily that, that I'm not satisfied with that. I think that I had that quality of, yes, I'm happy to be told where to go and how to go there, but I didn't arrive where I was supposed to arrive. So then I had to start challenging it. What were the signs that you weren't arriving where you were supposed to arrive? I was still a difficult, self-obsessed, um, stupid person and I'd been led to believe that yoga would help me not to be say more about that <laughs> well I could just see I think it took me many years but um, you know after 15 20 25 years it was really clear clear that that people were not finding being around Godfrey any easier than they ever had that he was still confusing them exasperating them um, and from their point of view, you know, being irresponsible, insensitive, selfish, um, and, and I, I wouldn't argue with any of those those um, accusations if that's what they what that's what they were. And I could see that, and 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 it just didn't seem right to me. It just seemed well, you know, even if I was wrong to think so, that a spiritual practice such as yoga should make you a less difficult kind of human being to relate to. But it clearly wasn't the case. From there, eventually, in the early 90s, you went to India. What was that experience like? Um, I think the only significant element of it were two. One, um, I met the gurus, well, two of them, Mr. Enga. I didn't study with, with Patabi Joyce because he, he, he was just coming back from a tour of America. But I, let's just say I came face to face with the living embodiment of the yoga tradition and I wasn't impressed. And so this allowed me to let go of the internalization of authority that I'd done with them, you know, because they both used to be in my mind. I would have conversations with them in a sense about yoga, about why it wasn't working for me. And, and in those conversations, I was always kind of at fault. Um, but then once I'd been to India, I just thought, hey, they're just guys like me, you know. Um, maybe they're smart, maybe they're not. Um, you have to find your own way, Godfrey. Um, so that was that was important. And the, the, on, the only other significant element, really, which was nothing to do with yoga practice teaching, was nevertheless that I totally loved being in India. Um, I felt very, very at home there. I, I never felt... Well, I never was harassed or, or hassled, um, or maybe I just didn't feel it. But um, it was it was it was a beautiful experience for me, and that beauty actually began the moment I stepped off the plane onto the tarmac. Each time I went, then I, my body would start to very very subtly vibrate in the most delicious way, and of course I recognized that from my my study of yoga literature as. I was getting in touch with Ananda Mayakosha. Um, and of course, that was a delicious thing to be, to be so um, thrust, have that thrust upon you without any, any need to even become quiet or sit still or, or even look inside. So that was kind of a big deal. Yeah. What is Ananda Mayakosha? Well, my understanding of it is it's supposedly one of the five sheaths or bodies, um, each one made up of different things. The most superficial one is, is, is um, supposedly made of food, which you know, makes sense. Um, and the most deep one is this one, Ananda Maya Kosha. Maya means material or made of, Kosha means sheath or body, and, and Ananda means bliss or ecstasy or delight. Um, and... Of course, well, I say of course to you because you know me. I don't believe that we have five different bodies, but I, but I believe that our presence uh, can be experienced in different ways through its different frequencies. And the fundamental frequency of our body and of consciousness is bliss. What was the experience of that resonating or activation of that Ananda Maya Kosha? Well, it was just, just feeling it. I would just step off the plane 
and I would feel it. And of course, I could be distracted from feeling it by excitement or interesting or a conversation or something. But if I was walking on the street or lying in bed or sitting in a chair doing nothing, I would just be feeling my body vibrating on this rhythm of pleasure, very, very subtle, soft, kind of shimmering. Why do you think India activated that? Well, I, I could only speculate, you know, and being rather hard-nosed realist as I actually am, which might be strange for somebody who's into all of these things, it's probably geology. Go on. Well, I think that's at the base, you know, but then there's thousands of years of culture, not the, not the most recent, not, not since they started being invaded by, by Europeans and, and Middle Eastern people, but um, they, 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 they had a culture um, that even if it didn't fully understand it in, in, the, in the ways that we understand so deeply things like lightning and, and DNA these days, um, they, they had a remarkable understanding of the significance, even if not the nature, of consciousness. And you could say the whole culture celebrated it. And you think that somehow seeps into the soil? No, I think there was something there first in the geology. That's how I see it. But, but I might be wrong. That, that supported human intelligence moving in that direction. But that's totally conjectural. Fascinating. Could you tell us a bit about your meetings with those living embodiments of yoga, Iyengar and so on? How did you meet them? What was, what was the story, if you like? And why was it that you weren't impressed? Well, I wasn't able to, to um, engage with Patabi Joyce as, as, well, in any way, really. But I had a little interaction with his grandson. And, and I don't want to go into the details, but it was just really pathetic. And, and, I, and I considered him to be an absolute arrogant idiot. Um, and I have to say that nothing I've heard about him since would really challenge that opinion. Um, with Mr. Enga, it was a different story. I, I really enjoyed um, studying with him, but I could just see his fallibility. You know, that he was a normal human being with, with remarkable gifts and many faults, and I could see some of his faults. I don't agree with those people who regard him as a sadomasochist. He hit me. It didn't hurt. It felt like love. It felt like support. Now, that might be slightly twisted, but that doesn't make him a sadomasochist. It just m means that he was, um, from our point of view, a little bit naive about social power dynamics. Can you say a bit more about that? Which bit? His naivety or social power dynamics? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think perhaps perhaps both in, in the same way. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're coming there from Montessori perspective, and the people listening might not know much about Iyengar at all. Yeah. Including any rumors or accusations. Yeah. Well, I think for me, the bottom line is um, that human intelligence is deeply filtered in order for us to survive. And this is what I learned through LSD. And what, what I learned through the Montessori method is that human intelligence is then shaped by your experience. Um, so if you have two twins and you separate them and one is brought up in France and one is brought up in Persia, they'll become fluent in two different languages. Um, so experience shapes the formation of intelligence. And what that means in a, in, in a kind of extreme expression of it, but extreme doesn't mean not true, is that we are all totally conditioned by forces and factors that go back from our everyday experience through our lives all the way to our genetic code, which, of course, has evolved in the same way over billions of years. Um, so for me, it's, it's very clear that a human being is a product of their time. A human being is a product of their place in society. A human being is a product of um, their culture and their society. And it's naive to um, think that they should have seen the world in the way that we do now with our, let's say, advantage of um, time and accumulation and exposure to information and, and wide-ranging dialogue and conversation that were not available, let's say, to Mr. Engar, as they are to me and you. So from that point of view, um, I, I think it's, it's not unfair to say, well, this was a bit out, you know, this was a bit, mm, this was a bit mean or whatever, but to, to, to cast somebody as a sadomasochist or as a bad person, which is what some people are definitely trying to do um, with him, um, I think it misunderstands the nature of the human situation very, very deeply, and not just relative to that, 
but it actually leaves people trapped in um, points of view that create conflict, which is the point of view that everybody is free to determine their own lives and their own points of view for themselves, and they're not. Another important figure that you met in India was Ramesh Balsakar. That's the case. An Advaita teacher, disciple of Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj, and a former president of the Bank of India. Local. Oh, lo- local okay. branch. Yeah, he was, the, it was, he, he was just president of, of the local branch in Bombay. Yeah, this is a, a nice exaggeration. But anyway, it's no big deal. The point is, he went to the London School of Economics. He was fluent in English and mathematics. So he, he, he wasn't a, you know, a... Uh, uh, I don't know what people might think, you know, that an Indian guru might be somehow culturally not sophisticated or something, um, which, of course, would be a form of, um, what should we call it, racism, I suppose. But um, he, I the think the truth is there, Steve, that I had actually been exposed to what I would call the penetrating beauty of Ramesh's perspective by somebody other than him. So by the time I went to see him, which I went to do a few times, um, I, you could say I'd already got the point and I just wanted to, to kind of say hello, even if not face to face, but I, I did do that. Um, so, so it wasn't really him. I didn't have a, a, a guru relationship with him. I, I didn't feel, wow, he's amazing. I just thought this, this point of view is fantastic. And, and uh, yeah, that's it. So it was Zen first and Ramesh second, is that right, in terms of the chronology? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, let's start there in that case. And some, somewhere along the way, you encountered Zen. Yeah. And the teacher, Genpo Roshi, yes. an American Zen teacher and creator or discoverer of the big mind process. Yeah. In dedication, you write about him, Soten Genpo Roshi. For giving me back myself. Yeah. And in the dedication of Yoga Unveiled, your translation and commentary of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, you write to Soten Genpo Roshi for showing me the way in. Yes. And to Kali for showing me the way out. Yes. <laughs> Can you uh, talk a bit about that? What was your encounter with Zen? Well, it was an, an amazing experience to subject myself to the kind of discipline and um, guidance of, of other people, which as a yoga practitioner, I hadn't really done. I'd gone to workshops, classes, I'd been to India, but, but on an ongoing regular basis, I, I didn't expose myself to a feedback process. So um, it, it, was, it was a very powerful experience for me. And when I say thanking him for giving me about myself, basically what that means is I picked up all kinds of spiritual ideas that that had made me go into denial about things about myself that I didn't like. You know, my anger, my judgmentalism, whatever, my elitism. Um, and in my Zen training, I could see, hey, hey, here they are. You know, you have to come to terms with them and, and accept yourself the way you are. So that's what that referred to. Um, the other reference, showing me the way in, uh, I learned really... I think there might be a third, but I'm forgetting it right now. Two things of great importance from um, Zen. And the first one was how to, in the Zen terminology, become one with something. And that something was always an element of my experience. So how to become one with my anger, how to become one with my sadness, how to become one with my confusion, how to become one with, with how to become one with. Um, and... Um, in the years since, being a yoga teacher um, involved in, let's say, navigating physical sensations on a regular basis, I've come to understand that actually what I was doing, that I was being taught how to really, really, really feel Um, and learning from what it means to really, really feel um, what first of all, intimacy means, and secondly, what what the whole process of um, experiencing as a human being is based on. So that was the first thing, particular thing that that I learned. And the second thing that I learned, which was perhaps more important for my experience, but not more important than the other one for my teaching, was how to do nothing, even though, of course, doing nothing is a contradiction in terms. But that, that was the second thing that I learned. 
What's the story of your of your encounter with Zen? From India, what happened next? Yes, it was my disappointment with my um, my foolish ideas that Mr. Anger, Patabi Joyce, you know, would have all the answers and they'd be able to give them to me. My realization that that was never going to be the case, um, combined with my uh, recognition that I was still the same old fucking wanker that I'd always been, um, and that I needed some help of, of, of another kind, not somebody just to give me the answers as if by magic, but somebody who could help me to, to really come to terms with myself. And I'd always been fascinated by Zen to the extent that when I was 1974, so when I was 16, I set off from England with a friend of mine um, who was 15, and our intention was to hitchhike to Japan and join a Zen monastery, but I got stuck in Rome because I fell in love. So Zen had always been something in my mind as, as something worth exploring. So when these two disappointments with the unchanging nature of my difficult personality and, and, and the, the, the disappointment in, in the yoga gurus, I turned my eyes to see where, where can I study Zen. And, Genpo was doing a session not so far away, so I went. Where was that? That was somewhere in Hertfordshire, in a, in a Theravadan Buddhist monastery. Is there any story there, your first session meeting Genpo Roshi? <laughs> yeah, of course, there's a few stories. Um, I was late, um, and I managed to work out where they were and where they were meditating, and I sat down in this kind of thin corridor, which I presumed would be the way in, the way out. And of course, I, I sat down in full lotus, just in case anybody might see me. And um, of course, somebody did. And anyway, the, the, the gong went, and then I could hear all this rustling. And then the door opened, and out came this, it was kind of like a whirlwind of this figure, which was Genpo, in his brocade robes, which are hundreds of years old. And um, he saw this thing in slightly in his way and he just gave me the dirtiest of dirty looks um as he went by um and even though i was slightly kind of shocked by by the moment i was also reassured by uh, the, the the what i considered the disdain with which he looked at me <laughs> somehow that reassured me <laughs> i suppose i thought okay this guy's gonna see my shit uh-huh what was that session like? I mean, you know, your body is able to sit perfectly in, in Lotus. You must have really looked apart. Uh, well, not to the monks, I didn't. To the monks, I looked like an arrogant little twat. Um, and, you know, there was, there was a lot of truth in that. They, they, they saw rigidity in my posture. They saw ego in my posture. They saw pride in my posture. Um, but what I and, and they were there. They they were seeing very clearly what was there. Um, but the experience there has has um, a full lotus element, which is that I had been meditating for many 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 years, but I'd never meditated for more than twenty minutes or so. And it was very easy for me to sit down, cross my legs, and in the terminology that we've already been used, just slip down into an andamaya kosha, just slip down into the presence of bliss. And, and um, all of a sudden, I was confronted by something altogether different, which was actually really the pain of sitting in full lotus 40 minutes after 40 minutes after 40 minutes after 40 minutes for many hours a day. You know, maybe it's about eight hours a day if you include the chanting and everything, which you don't have to sit in lotus in any of them. But of course, God, we had to sit in lotus um, just in case anybody was looking. Um, and on the third, the morning, the third morning when we'd had two and a bit days, um, an announcement was that anybody who was on their first or second session could go to a, a group meeting with Genpo. Um, there was maybe 30 people there. There was maybe 120 people all, all together there. And um, I sat off to one side, not too far away because my hearing wasn't very good. And I sat down knowing perfectly well that I was not going to say anything because I don't like to say things in public unless I'm determining the situation, you know, so I'm kind of like a teacher. I'm not a very good student. And um, anyway, he, he said, first thing he said was, does anybody have any questions? And before I could stop myself, I blurted out, 
why the fuck does it have to hurt so much? Um, which kind of surprised the part of me that I spoke. It surprised a, a, another part of me, the, the kind of intensity of it. And, and he just smiled and he said, you're sitting in full lotus? as a question, but of course, obviously he knew that I was. And I said, yes. He said, every time I said, yes. He said, good, keep doing it. The pain will get worse, but you'll get through it faster. And that's, that's all he said. So I, I took from that, that pain was something that one was going to have to go through whether one sat in full Lotus or not. Of course, I wasn't able to sit in full Lotus every time. Um, because it was way too painful. Um, but that whole process taught me how to become one with pain. So it was actually a wonderful thing, even though it was an incredibly challenging thing. And I think day one, possibly not. Day two, day three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, every single day, there was a kind of exercise break in which I went outside and did yoga. And then after I'd done my yoga, I would lie down in the grass and put my head in the grass and have a, a kind of a battle with myself. Part of me was saying, God, forget the fuck out of here. This is hell. And the other part of me saying, God, you've got to stay here. This is heaven. This is amazing. This is exactly what you want. Luckily, the second voice won and I stayed. How does one become one with pain? One becomes one with pain by feeling it as deeply as possible. By not turning away from it, not chitta vritti, not turning the mind away, but just being fully present. And being fully present to physical pain means to the sensations that are expressing and indicating that pain. So it's, a, it's not a conceptual process and the mind becomes very, very, very quiet. Does the pain go away? In that moment of becoming one with the pain, yes. It's transformed into a completely different kind of experience. What is the experience that it's transformed into? That's for the people who experience it to know. And there's a reason why you're saying that, isn't there? There's something behind that, an approach. <laughs> yes, we, we all have to find out for ourselves. And if, if people tell us what the answer is in terms of inner experience, um, the, the power of self-deception, which ling lingers in everybody's intelligence, makes it only too easy for us to tell ourselves we've arrived at a place that we haven't actually yet arrived at. But then we never have to arrive there because we convinced ourselves that we have. Gumpa Roshi is a Rinzai Roshi. Not really. His teachers, teachers, teachers have blended the two. They were actually a Soto school, but they used the Ren Rinzai Koan system. So were you studying Koan on that retreat? On that retreat, yes, I, yes, yes, it began on that retreat. What was the study of koan like for you? It was an encounter with frustration, pain, and arrogance. Can you say a bit more about that? <laughs> well, it just showed me all that shit in myself, you know. Um, but I, I have to say that I'm not really quite sure why this, and you'd have to... Um, interview Genpo on this and he would I'm sure he would remember we we, 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 we stay in touch with each other um, I I didn't go the usual path he used to invite me to to meetings that only other people present were monks of, of many years experience and they were not happy that I that there was somebody present who wasn't in robes and who wasn't um, hadn't taken Jukai you know wasn't formally his student and didn't have a spiritual name but um, it seems to me that Genpo, um, you know, either he just liked me or he, he could see that um, there was something going on there. And maybe all he could see was that this guy at the time I was is a famous yoga teacher. So um, I better help him as much as possible so that he's misleading people as little as possible. Say a bit more about what happened next in terms of your trajectory in Zen. You took an unusual path there. Well, what happened next in terms of my Zen training really was that I... I arrived after many years of failure at the point of doing nothing, um, and, and that was the end of it, really. Are you talking about Kensho? I wouldn't use any such terms. I, w I, wasn't, you know, I wasn't a monk. I wasn't doing those things. I wasn't following the path, so there was no talk of things like that. Um, I think that they were just trying to help me where I was. 
as a yoga teacher, they were always telling me that I should stop doing yoga, not because they had anything against yoga, but because at least in the beginning, they could see how deeply identified I was with my so-called prowess and my my place in the yoga world, which at that time I was probably the most well-known, famous um, yoga teacher in Europe. I was in the media all the time at that at that point. So they could see how that was, was dangerous for me. Um, and they could also see I was not going to become a Buddhist. I was not going to become a monk. I was not going to become a member of the Sangha. Um, but that I was obviously turning up for something. How much then did you do? Uh, I would say there was five or six years uh, in which I did as many sessions as possible, but it, it probably doesn't add up to more than six months, you know, of days worth of practice um, altogether, um, which from a Zen point of view is not a lot. Because a lot of people spend years and years and years as monks, um, but for me, it it was it was a big commitment. I was working, I had children, um, but but it was at the time it was my principal motivation was was to get on session and to sit down in full lotus and to have the meetings with the teacher because it was in the meetings with the teachers that I was really confronted with all of my psychological bullshit and and helped to really come to terms with it. What was it about the meetings with the teacher that catalyzed that confrontation with your psychological stuff? Well, I, I, I don't know what it's like for other people, but I think that's the purpose of the meetings, um, to, to, be, to present a mirror to you in which, in which you see all the things that are getting in your way. Could you give an example? Well, yeah, any time you wanted to report something that you were proud of, um, the focus became your pride rather than mm. your wisdom. Whew, a little bit, whoa, here we go again. It was, it was like being slapped over and over again, but not slapped in an aggressive way. You know, just come to your senses, come to your senses. That's nonsense. You know, that's just a projection. The word is makyo, you know, that's just a fantasy. That's just wishful thinking. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a very, very thorough exposure to the capacity of human intelligence to deceive itself. And self-deception was a word that was used a lot. And I'm a little on the fence about asking this question I don't like feasting on this sort of thing but go ahead people will know Genpo Roshi for a few reasons one of them is he's an extremely famous Zen teacher and creator of the big mind process but also he became quite well known for being involved in a moral uh, scandal scandal that's the word I'm looking for uh, in which he had a series of affairs with some of his students were you around during that time and you're talking about self-deception and and things of that nature. Do you have any comment on that? Well, I wasn't around at the time. And my, my only comment is what, for me, was so great about Genpo was that it was very clear that he was a normal human being with the normal human traits, but who nevertheless had a very profound and subtle grasp from a particular perspective on the way human intelligence functions and creates suffering for itself and can be freed from that. I'll just give you an example of, of, of that was after I'd been on one session in Holland. This is many, many years ago. Um, I was in the airport and I, this guy came by who was as one of the senior monks who was also English and he was also flying back to England. And he sat down and he said, Godfrey, why are you coming to these sessions? And he asked it because he, he thought I was very arrogant because of the way I sat so still and so upright in full lotus. And he was right up to a point. And, and I said, um, because I, I need help. And he said, well, we can all see that, but why, why have you chosen a Zen master? And I said, I haven't chosen a Zen master. I've, I've chosen this particular human being who happens to be a Zen master. And he said, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, I, I trust him. And he said, why do you trust him? And I said, because I know for certain that it's very possible that I could go now into the gent's toilet and find him masturbating. And the, the guy got really, really angry, got up and stormed away for disrespecting his teacher. But I didn't think I was being disrespectful at all. I was basically saying, this guy's for real. He's a real human being, so he can help human beings. He wasn't pretending. He wasn't pretending to be anything. We don't have to in the past tense. He's not pretending to be anything. You write here, Anta Kali, for showing me the way out. Is that Kali the person or Kali the goddess? What do you mean by that? Well, that was the name taken by a Brazilian woman um, 
who was the person who exposed me to Ramesh's version of non-duality. Um, so what it means by showing me the way out um, was, was um, Genpo showed me the way in, how to go very, very deep in, and she showed me how to make that significant in life. Is this the woman that you encountered meditating who you couldn't manipulate? Who is that woman? You're going to have to remind me. I, I seem to remember you telling a story once of walking into a room and a woman was there meditating and you were so stunned because you immediately recognized that you couldn't manipulate her. No, I think that story refers to the first Zen teacher on my first Zen session who was sitting there in silent meditation and, and I realized that there was nothing about her that I could use um, to kind of to orchestrate what was going to happen, that she was a completely empty mirror and that, in a sense, the only person in the room was me, <laughs> which was a little bit intense. <laughs> so how did Kali show you the way out? By, by helping me to see really clearly um, what wholeness, what unity, what non-duality, what singularity, what the totality means, that... The, the, there is no doer, what the Bhagavad Gita is trying to say, that there is no doer. And, and she, she didn't do it particularly in a conceptual way. She did it through very, very, you could say intimate, not sexually intimate, but intimate interactions with me over a period of about three months, which again were, were very painful. I, I remember one particular incident. I was down on my knees in the dirt. This was in Ibiza. I was living in Ibiza. So this kind of behavior is acceptable in Ibiza, you know, at least it used to be. And she was sitting on her chair and I, I was down on my knees, and with my fists, I was kind of gently pounding her thighs, crying. Um, I don't remember exactly what it was about. I know it was something to do with my mother um, and the woman I was involved with. Just to say my, my relationship to women was kind of like I was just seeing it, and I was freaking out about it. Um, it was it was a, It was a... A process that in one sense was not unlike what I'd gone through with Zen, but it was much more intense because it was it was just within what looked like a personal relationship. You know, people going for a, to a woman and a man going for a walk on the beach, sitting on the beach, going to a restaurant, whatever, rather than in a, a monastic, I was about to say contrived setting. Um, and it was very, very intense. And, and what, I, what I felt like, I don't know if this was self-deception or not, but I felt like that she somehow was able to feel or recognize the the, the little grains of, um, I, w I don't like the word ego, but the little grains of selfhood that, that Zen had not eroded. Um, and she kind of uh, brought them into the light for me to deal with. Um, so that was Carly. How did she bring them into the light for you to deal with? What was it about your relationship with this person that uh, produced that? She didn't, have, she didn't have a technique, but she had an amazing ability to know what was going through my mind and to say something um, that showed me that, that, that she was kind of like in my mind. Um, and so this kind of made me, you know, not realizing in a sense in the moment and not choosing to, but it just, what's the point in in putting up a show or any defenses if they're all being seen through. Were you in a romantic relationship with this person or was it a teaching relationship? No. No, it was a guru Chela relationship um, in, in which I was totally in love with her in that way. I wanted to be with her all the time. And sometimes I'd, I'd be there at night and I'd be lying on her bed with her, but not as her, as her lover. Um, although I, I, I definitely... Um, let her know that I was ready to be, and she definitely let me know that that was not on the table. In your, in your uh, bio, it also talks quite a bit about your study of Tantra. Is this the entry point to that? No, the entry point to Tantra came when I was very young, not from a, an overtly Tantric teacher or person, but from the woman who, who I wanted to be with, to do the Montessori method with, um, she she taught me not how to become one with what I felt, but she taught me how important it is to acknowledge and to honor your feelings rather than to deny them. And I consider that to be a tantric approach. So she was my first 
tantric teacher and in a way the most important because my whole life has has unfolded with with that sense that you know you don't need to run away from what you feel you need to accept and acknowledge and deal with what you feel and you had further tantric studies beyond that i wouldn't say studies i had encounters with various women some of them were um i'm trying to remember i think i think about five some of them were short-lived um one was a woman well no two were, were women in india um that you know lasted a few days or one of them a little bit longer um Another one, there, there was a woman in Ibiza, an Italian woman, that, that lasted for a few months. Um, Carly was definitely, I would put her in that category, um, of women who, who, who helped me to uh, loosen the kind of, the, 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 the patriarchal way of thinking and being and doing and what success means and what it means to be, I don't know, anything. Um, so I'm using the word tantric there very, very loosely and not necessarily in any way overtly sexual. What was the trajectory of your relationship with Kali? What's the rest of the story? Well, the rest of the story is um, there was a three months intense thing. And then the next year she came back and she lived in our little community and it was all very relaxed. And it was kind of like job done, really, you know, so... Um, so then I, I had this fantasy that she would stay there, that she would kind of be the guru and I could just be the yoga teacher and she could help people in the way that she'd helped me. But she, she had this thing with me. I don't know if it was true, but she said, no, Godfrey, I'm, I'm, I'm just a guru to you. Um, I'm not a guru for everybody. Um, I don't know if, if she still thinks that, I know she's functioning as a teacher, but she's not overtly presenting herself as a guru. And she was definitely then and definitely in her relationship to me. She, I would say she wanted as much as I wanted our relationship to be of that kind. Um, there was definitely a sexual chemistry between us, but and I wanted to act on it. But she was very clear that there was something else going on. And what was that thing, do you think? And, and what, what is a guru relationship fundamentally? Well, in the way that I see it is something makes one person, the chela, totally trust the guru. And that was the case. I totally trusted her, despite the fact that it was incredibly painful to be in that kind of relationship with her. That trust allowed me to, to, to see things about myself. It was painful because, because I was confronted with, with things like my jealousy, my neediness, my, what, I don't even remember all of it, but it was, I remember it was painful. It, it, there were times I would refuse to, to go and see her. You know, her friends would say, Godfrey, Carly wants to see you. And I said, no, I'm not going anywhere near that bitch. <laughs> but then I would. <laughs> With Carly, it was more like a process at the end of which I just realized that I was, I was kind of, experiencing myself in the world in, in a much in a different way which was much much lighter and more forgiving I think from Zen it was also lighter but it was more ex it was more about accepting whereas somehow with Kali it was forgiving in the sense that um, I could accept uh, within myself and others anything really you know I I, I I suppose I, what she helped me to do is to see that concepts and, and reactions around such concepts as evil or even wrong, how they're, they're not just meaningless and arbitrary constructs, but how dangerous they are. One of the things that has always fascinated me about you is how you talk about your past, speaking of memories and how you're really quite scathing about your previous iterations as a very, very famous, successful <laughs> yoga teacher, for example. Could you, could you talk a bit about that? Well, you know, I mean, I've, I've, first of all, you could say I've lived a long time, and I've lived totally outside of the constraints of conventional society. I've never wanted a career. I've never wanted a home. I've never wanted a family. Of course, I've got four children, but it's not something that I set out to do. I just wanted to know what the fuck is really going on here. 
And I didn't mean politically, socially. I mean, in, in human intelligence, human experience, human consciousness. What is it? You know, what are we? What's really going on? Um, so I, I, uh, I've gone through a lot of stuff. You know, you could say maybe I've lived 10, 15 lifetimes compared to, to some people. Um, and I don't make that as a boast. I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing. That's just the way that it is. I've done many, many, many things. Um, which means I've made a huge amount of mistakes. I've had a huge number of presumptions and prejudices confronted often painfully by my life experience. Um, so actually, I, I, I love all of those people, all of those it reiter iterations of myself. But, you know, I can see that very clearly the, the foolishness of them. My current iteration, I suppose I'll have to move to the next one before I can really see my current foolishnesses clearly. Your approach to yoga was really, really quite different from, um, and in some senses at, odd, at odds with, how yoga posture practice is usually taught today. And I think there are a few factors as to why that is. Perhaps most fundamentally, it's to do with the distinction you make between self-improvement and self-inquiry. And you write, in order for a postural practice to be yoga, it must be a process of genuine self-inquiry rather than self-improvement. The difference between them is the difference between Charles Atlas and Ramana Maharshi. Genuine inquiry is not a covert attempt to reach a preferred conclusion or prove a point. Yoga practice in any form must be based on what is and not on what is hoped for. Self-inquiry depends on a willingness and ability to examine yourself just as you are, putting aside all preferences and prejudice and the self-deception they generate. Can you talk a bit about the difference between self-improvement and self-inquiry in the context of yoga posture practice? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't conceptualize it like that for many years, but I could feel it and see it and made my choices um, around it. I, so I think the, the, the three, maybe four most common ways that people um, misapproach yoga, in my opinion, um, is trying to get something out of it that they think will make them somehow in some way better. So first is flexibility to become more flexible. Second is strength to become more strong. Usually those are pursued together. Um, third is alignment is, is the third one. You know, if I just can learn to line up my body parts correctly, then to quote Mr. Enger, alignment is enlightenment. So then I'll be enlightened. And then that's the fourth one, common one. People doing yoga to become enlightened as opposed to doing yoga to find out who they are. And all of these and any other similar approaches to yoga as what I'm calling self-improvement, target, aim, go for it, um, can not provide the claims, let's say, that yoga has always made that it can provide which is the deepest possible peace, for example, compassion, understanding, wisdom, whatever. They don't come from becoming better and better and better at something. Where do they come from? Becoming intimate with your own nature. And how would one do that through a yoga posture practice? Well, in a way, one would do it in exactly the same way as one would, would meditating, but the, the, the field would be a little bit different. One, one does it by becoming intimate with physical sensations. Why is that so easy to miss on the mat? Well, it's easy to miss because there's a goal that you're looking for, looking at targets, more flexibility, more strength. Or it may not be uh, consciously articulated, but it, you can see it's there in the motivation and it's there in the, the, the path that's undertaken. Mastering postures, first this posture, then that posture, and they become more and more difficult, more and more complex, more and more challenging, or, or more and more something. So um, if, you, if you're following that, approach if you have a target even if it's not clearly defined um but i want to get there then you are never going to become intimate with your own nature because intimacy with your own nature requires you let go of all strategies all intention and this is perhaps hardest of all all effort and just settle into what's already fully present Every effort, every intention moves you away from that. What would a yoga posture practice without effort look like or feel like? Look like, uh, depends who's looking. 
somebody who has no prejudice about what yoga should look like, it, to them it would look like something very soft, fluid, and yummy. Um, what it would feel like would be something very soft, fluid, and yummy. Something you said that I think uh, encapsulates this is uh, it's part of this is uh, that your assumptions about your practice will guide and inform your practice, even if those assumptions are unconscious. Especially. Yeah. Yeah. One of the ways in which you express this that was influential on me has been your way of describing the five yamas. You render them very differently than the usual way in which the yamas are rendered. And I think that's fair to say your translation and, and commentary on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, Yoga Unveiled, is quite a different approach to the Yoga Sutras that are, that are usually presented. Maybe a couple of lines about what the Yoga Sutras are and how the, the five yamas relate to what you've just been saying. Okay, to me, um, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali are just a map of, of the interior domain of human consciousness. They're not a how-to manual. Um, they're, they're a map. Um, and basically what they're mapping is, is what happens when intelligence internalizes eventually in upon itself um, and I wouldn't be able to have anything to say about the Yoga Sutras other than it's just nonsense if it weren't for my Zen training um, so it's not that I, I put I project Zen or Buddhism onto my understanding of Patanjali but it's just that I have a certain experience um, that allowed me to make sense of Patanjali, but not only that, Patanjali's words, concepts um, helped me to understand my experience. Um, so I think that I've been really blessed in that sense. You know, when I, my friends in the Zen world, they cannot articulate their inner experiences in the way that I can. And I think that one of the reasons why I can articulate my inner experiences is because Patanjali gave me a vocabulary, a very clear, to me, a very clearly defined vocabulary to do that. So that leads us to Yama. And for me, um, Patanjali mapping human consciousness, Yama and Niyama are placed in, 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 in a significant place, really, by him. You know, when he's presenting yoga, the practice, the activity, yoga um, has these eight, Anga, these eight limbs, of course, they're not steps. It's not a linear sequential relationship that they have, even though we may experience them, at least initially, in a linear sequential way. But there's a clear distinction made between the first two and the last six. And then within the last six, there's distinctions made between the first three of those and, and the last three of those. But um, to me, yama and niyama are the portals. And that's probably the case for most people, but you know that, that, that you, you need to go through them um, to arrive at the first inner anga, the inner first inner or experiential limb of yoga, which is asana. Um, but most people understand them as kind of things that you must do or things that you must not do. Nobody, to my satisfaction, ever explains why that's the case, how that works. It's just assumed um, that, you know, you have to be a good boy in order to get the fruit of spiritual experience. Um, but to me, I have to say it's very clear that, that, that um, yama are five, and not the five, but they are five um, ways through which consciousness expresses itself. One is sensitivity. Consciousness, you could say, is in touch with what's, whatever, whatever is present. It, 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 it doesn't miss anything. Um, honesty or satya, it, 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 it doesn't fool itself about what's present. It's the mind that deceives, but not consciousness. Um, consciousness is open. Asteya, to me, is being open. Um, of course, it's open. It's completely open. It's not closed. The mind does the closing. Um, brahmacharya. Th thank you, Ramesh. Thank you, Ramana Maharshi, for saying Brahmacharya it doesn't mean celibacy. It means flowing with the creative principle, Charya, flowing with Brahma, the creative principle of the Hindu trinity, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Um, so to me, I understand Brahmacharya is meaning being intimate with what is or intimacy. And, and the, the fifth one, Aparigraha, 
to me quite clearly means selflessness or generosity. Um, and these are all qualities of consciousness. But they're not um, qualities of consciousness that we need to replicate because they're qualities of consciousness. All we need to do is, you could say, carry with us into our lives. He actually says they're relevant in every circumstance, um, but definitely to our mat or cushion, carry them with us as um, lenses through which we can perhaps become more clear about what's actually happening when we're on our mat or on our cushion. And then if that's the case, if I have given some value to ahimsa or sensitivity to satya or honesty, then there's more chance that if I'm being violent or dishonest, I'll notice. But in that noticing of my violence, that noticing is itself a moment of sensitivity. And my noticing my dishonesty, that noticing in itself is a moment of honesty. So in an almost magical way, these five properties of consciousness reinforce themselves, even if you're expressing their opposites. That's quite a radical interpretation, I think. It's not just radical, Steve. It's very, very powerful. Certainly. And, you know, if you don't, if somebody, I'm not talking about you, if somebody doesn't want to take it, they'd rather see them as moral injunctions. So be it. But don't be surprised if yoga doesn't deliver the deep fruits that it's always promised. That's how they're most commonly taught, isn't it? These are the ethical precepts that serve as the foundation for the, the, the following steps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's to reduce Patanjali's mind to, to that of what? I don't know. Mary Whitehouse. We've talked a lot about asana. And what about pranayama? The way in which that's approached is, is once again very different from the way in which you teach it. Once upon a time, many years ago, a yoga teacher who was a friend of mine, she wasn't really my student, but she came to um, class a couple of times. She's, she's not exactly famous, but she could be famous in that she, she was Russell Brand's teacher for a while. Um, she, she said something about the trouble with Godfrey is he, he wants to be different. But actually, this couldn't be further than the truth. It just, I just want to know what's going on, and I'm really not interested at all about how other people see me, whether they see me as different or the same, whether they see me as good or bad, whether they see me as whatever. That's, that's not my concern. I, I really, in this domain, have only one concern. That's finding out, hey, what actually is really going on, and how can we um, most easily find out? Um, so pranayama for me... Um, I suppose my experience of pranayama, first of all, I tried it for many years in, in, in the vein or approach of the Hatha Yoga Pratipika, you know, relating your breath according to preordained fixed formulae. And um, the effects were not pleasant. When I asked my Iyengar teachers to help me with that, they said, you have to go and see Mr. Iyengar. They, they wouldn't give me any help. So, so I, I, um, I experimented, which was I, I, I stopped for a few months and then I started again and it became very clear that what I was doing was not good for my nervous system, that it was it was creating some kind of perceptible disturbance in my nervous system, but at the same time it was creating a kind of a vulnerability um, to external pressure, external stresses. I, I was getting less I was less able to handle the normal everyday stresses of life, even something simple like missing a bus, seemed to really disturb me on a physical level. Um, so, so I, I stopped doing it, and then and then I got into Zen, and um, I learned from Zen that you don't need to do anything for these deep gifts that have always been promised by spiritual practice to reveal themselves. I learned that it's the opposite; you have to stop all of your doing. But of course, you can't deliberately stop all your doing; it has to stop. Um, having learned that, um, I thought, well, pranayama is about doing something. It's about most incredibly refined control over the fundamental expression of life itself. And it, it, that's a very, in my opinion now, definitely a foolish thing to do. But um, so at the same time as going to Ibiza, having finished all of my, well, not quite finished, but I still carried on going to Session a little bit for a couple of years. But um, also, having discovered Patanjali, I started experimenting with my breath from the point of view of 
not doing anything. And at the same time, I discovered that pretty much that's what Patanjali says. He, in his presentation of pranayama is basically just become intimate with your breathing and great things are going to happen. So why is it, do you think, that pranayama is so often an elaborate system of, uh, of, of breath control? Well, because that's how it, it, it or that's what it became in, in the 12th, 13th, 14th century record. Maybe it was like that before, but the Hatha Yoga text, Hatha Yoga Pratipika, Garanda Samhita, Shiva Samhita, they all have it in. So, of course, you know, we, we, we believe for some reason that it must be valid. And so we do it. And, and it's not that it doesn't do something. Of course it does something. But what it seems to do is, is just to give you a kind of intense energy. And what I see in people who do a lot of it is that energy may well be available for, let's say, physical activity. may well be that they don't have to sleep so much. But it seems to make them very, very arrogant very pleased with themselves, very pleased with the, the potency that they're experiencing in their body. This, this doesn't impress me. You know, anybody who's pleased with themselves doesn't impress me, but especially in the spiritual domain. This has been such a fascinating uh, conversation, Godfrey. I think we could end it now with this question. Another key distinction you make is the issue of authority. Yeah. And you write... Unintimidated by the ideologies and hierarchies of tradition, uh, Godfrey has been able to, this is in your bio, Godfrey has been able to cast a clear light, not only on the subtleties of yoga practice, but also on the nature of the body-mind relationship and the significance of human consciousness. This has allowed him to firmly establish yoga practice and theory in the wisdom of life itself, while grounding its expression in the language of everyday life. And we've talked, I think, about many of those aspects, but could you talk specifically about the issue of authority and what it means to be unintimidated by the ideologies and hierarchies of tradition. Well, where I'd like to begin is by saying that in one sense, to me, spiritual practice, self-inquiry, therefore meditation, therefore yoga, is in effect simply a process of internalizing authority, of releasing yourself from external authority and finding the wisdom within that then becomes your guiding light. Um, and I think most people who do yoga would agree with that, even if they wouldn't say internalizing authority. It's about going within, finding the wisdom within, finding your own guiding light. But I see that in terms of authority also. And that what this means is that one should lean on external authority as little as possible, whether that authority is in the form of a charismatic teacher um, or whether that authority is in terms of um, a written tradition or a set of techniques or anything like that. And um, I believe, perhaps wrongly, but that to the extent that anybody is clinging consciously or unconsciously to external authority, that's going to obscure, hinder their ability to find their inner authority. Of course, inner authority doesn't mean indulging your every whim. Not at all. Inner authority means something that would be quite difficult to explain in a few words to somebody that, that hasn't spent a lot of time hanging out with their own presence, enough time hanging out with their own presence to come to a, a reasonably workable understanding of human nature. Can you give an example of a difference between someone perhaps unknowingly operating, perhaps to do with yoga or meditation, via some external authority. Yeah, sure, sure. I think I can do that. The most simple one is assuming that knowledge is important. Whereas in fact, what's important is experience. People carry the kind of idea that, that once they um, know more about something, whether it's about the nature of reality or the nature of consciousness in a conceptual sense, then they'll have arrived. You know, I've, I don't know if I've told you this, Godfrey, before, but I first bumped into you, if you want, on YouTube, you were talking about Vinyasa Krama. You have a, a YouTube clip up there about Vinyasa Krama, which I'm, I'll put in the show notes for people to have a look at. And it made a tremendous amount of sense. I was, you know, interested. Oh, I think I'd look at yoga. And I was looking around and for, for some algorithmic reason on YouTube, I came upon that video and it made a tremendous amount of sense. And I must say that I'm very glad that I bumped into you on YouTube 
you were talking a lot about, and you have talked a lot about when I've uh, have studied with you in the past about this other way of doing yoga. You know, the way that isn't you know these these other ways. We've talked about this distinction, um, and I don't think I would have lasted very long in those other ways. The way you framed yoga posture practice and the way you framed meditation and these things has been extremely fruitful for me, and uh, there's been many rich adventures that have come from that from that framing that you that, that you laid out so uh, i want just want to say thank you very much well let me say you're very very welcome where can people find out more about you if they'd like to do so well i think the most simple place to start is dynamicyoga.com and you run uh, trainings uh, mostly in Europe, is that, is that correct? Residential trainings and various different workshops in Europe and the Middle East. Yeah, Middle East now is only Turkey. My, my, my um, territory is shrinking as I slip slowly towards retirement. Well, you heard it here, folks. <laughs> get, it while it's, get it while it's going. Get it while it's hot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, when I said slipping slowly into retirement, um, my my interest in, in the inner domain has peaked. And my interest now is, okay, how can all of this be really, really relevant in a world that's facing ecological catastrophe? So that's where my interest is now. So, for example, I don't think I'm going to do any yoga teacher trainings anymore. I'm just going to start doing what I'm at the moment calling embodied resilience training to help people um, – to access the inner resources that I think we're all going to need to face what's coming. So in that case, if there is something to say to people who are listening to this, who share your concern, uh, perhaps can't make it to one of your trainings, to uh, one of these embodied resilience trainings, what would you say to them? Become intimate with your own presence. Trust, trust the good feelings that you find within yourself, that they're not aberrations or momentary psychological episodes, that they're expressions of, of your deeper nature and there's a, there's a very deep strength in love. I think that's an excellent place to leave it. Godfrey, thank you very much for this conversation. You're very welcome, Steve. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.